And we run down to the shelter in our house. Uh, we close the uh, door of the, of the shelter. Um, and then we go come out up 10 minutes afterwards. And my wife tells me, Ami, um, this is like the Yom Kippur War. Today, we're running a special episode of Invested uh, in light of the massacre that happened on October 7th in the south of Israel um, and the incredible response of Israeli civic society uh, since then. I really want to thank everyone for joining and listening to this episode. And I have with me today Ami Daniel. Ami Daniel is the CEO and founder, co-founder of Winward, a company that Olive has invested in. And we'll talk more about Winward soon. Uh, but we want to start by talking about October 7th, which we'll come to in a second, Shabbat or Saturday morning, October 7th. But before we get to that, Ami, tell me, how is your family doing? How is that do your wife and your kids doing? First of all, thank you for having me, Michael. It's great to be here. I think it's super important to talk about uh, what happened, but also what can we do about it? Uh, my wife is okay. My kids are okay. I got to say, they're, they're a bit afraid now. Uh, I think what happened... Um, uh, I think it was the actual definition of terror. Um, my kids sometimes wake up at night or walk in the street and say, can, can, can you, daddy, can you make sure people don't kidnap us? So I think it's way beyond just, you know, an alarm or two. It's an ins- instilling that fear, I think, in kids and citizens, um, which are afraid of exactly that. Yeah. So October 7th, for those who don't remember, was a Shabbat or a Sabbath morning, Saturday morning uh, here in Israel. And... Um, it was also the holiday of Simchat Torah, which me- literally means the happiness with the Torah, with the with the Bible. Um, and take us through uh, your morning. Like you got up at six fifteen, it was on that morning. Six thirty two, I think. Six thirty two, you got up on that morning, and, and and just walk us through what happened. Yeah, so we wake up from an alarm at six thirty two a.m. Uh, we run down to the shelter. We have a shelter. An alarm is a siren. A siren, not, <laughs> not an alarm clock. A siren. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> a siren. We wake up from a siren. Uh, no alarm clock actually says this. Um, and we run down to the shelter in our house. Uh, we close the uh, door of the, of the shelter, um, and then we go come out up ten minutes afterwards. And my wife tells me, Ami, um, this is like the Yom Kippur War. Immediately, and I was looking at her and saying, w- w- "Why are you saying that?" We had sirens before. She says, "Listen, I can feel it. This is like the Yom Kippur War. Okay, we need to do something." Um, it, I, I got to say, it, it took me twenty-five minutes to sit on that because Yom Kippur was fifty years ago. By the way, exactly fifty years that day, I believe, uh, Michael. So I think it's actually quite symbolic, but also quite purposeful on their day, on 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 their behalf. Um, 25 minutes afterwards, I sit on it and they said, okay, listen, we need to do something. Um, what what can we do? And then it's 7.30 a.m. on Shabbat. Obviously, everybody should be asleep, right? It's Simchat Torah. And I pick up my phone, which is, by the way, usually closed. And it's, it's usually, I, 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 I turn it off and put it in a closet. It's my digital shop because it helped me clear my mind. Usually, that didn't work. Um, and then, and then... I you know I open the news and I see the videos of the, the trucks, Toyota trucks in Sdewot, which is a city down south, with a lot of turrets on them and RPGs. And I grab my head and I said, "Listen, this looks like a movie, right? Toyotas with terrorists in Sdewot. Uh I think it's a, I've never seen anything like it. It's um, important to point out that that you're actually not in the south of Israel. You're uh, uh, probably twenty kilo, fifteen kilometers northeast of Tel Aviv." Yeah, like I'm, I, li- I, I live northeast of Tel Aviv. I just see it in the TV. I see it in the computer. Um, I go up to my study where I'm right now, and I say, say to her, listen, we got to do something. And then I just start calling people, basically. I call you, Michael, but it's Shabbat, so it took me a few hours to get a hold of you. Um, I call some other people, and uh, my, my brother-in-law is very active in brothers and sisters in arms, which is a new civic movement which was built in the last 10 months. So I called him up and said, listen, did you see what happened down south? We need, we, we got to help them. Um, his name is Tamil. And he says, listen, let me let me check that. I'm back to you. He's checking with them. They didn't really know what to do. He calls me back, says, listen, I, I can't do anything to help. So I said, I say, okay, so I'll do it alone. No problem. And I started messaging in a lot of WhatsApp groups. Does anybody need help? Does anybody need help? I, I did this instinctively without any plan, obviously. Um, 
And then people start coming, start coming back to me. And the first guy actually is Elis Shafa, which you know very well. Um, a venture capitalist. Is a venture capitalist from Cornwall Capital. Yeah. We, we, we together went to meet some people, uh, uh, some internal Israeli things last 10 months. And he calls me back and says, I mean, my lawyer is riding on a car with a gun going down the south trying to rescue his daughter. And I was like, excuse me, can you please repeat that for me? He says, yes, my lawyer is in the car with a gun trying to rescue his daughter, but can you call him and help? I called this guy. I've never met him. I don't know who the guy is. He said, listen, they all, hey, what's your name? He says, yeah, what, can I help? He says, yes, my daughter was in the party. It was a big party uh, called Nova. The uh, Nova Peace but, Festival. Nova Peace Festival. It's about 1,500 or 1,300 young people celebrating peace. Uh, uh, a few kilometers from the uh, Gaza Strip. I think four or five kilometers. Uh, and she says, it says, listen, she got away from that. It was, they were massacred there. And she's hiding right now in in some open area. I'll give you her number. And then I WhatsApp her. And I said, you and your dad told me to help. How can I help? And she, and she writes me back, like in a second. Listen, my boyfriend and his friend, they tried to save us and they got shot. We're surrounded with bodies. We're just outside in this open area and we need help. Can you help me? Here's my location. She so sent me her WhatsApp location. And my instinct to respond to her was, I'm on it. Don't worry, we'll fix it. Why did they say that? I have no idea because I had no backing to say that, obviously. But just say, on it, you know, I'll, I'll get you out of there. Um, I turned to my wife and says, listen, what do you think we should do? And she says, listen, do you remember the guy who, who were in London a couple of years ago? Who started with us? He's a he's a um, uh, he's a general in, uh, in the army. How would you call it? Okay. I was his mentor, Michael. I think you put him together with him to mentor him in in some internal course. Yeah. You know I mean, uh, a few months ago. So I know him. I know his wife. I know his son. Right. I called and says, "Well, why listen? I have these people. They're they're just outside. We need to help them. What can I do?" He says, "Listen, I'm on vacation. Love that I can help, but he used the phone number." of the operations officer of Dallas South. Call him, tell him, I told you, I told him to help you. Um, said, okay, but please message him. I called the guy and I said, listen, you don't know me, my name is Ami, but I have people right now locked in with terrorists around them. Give me somebody to work with. And then from that sentence onwards, for the next three days or so, but specifically that Saturday, I made, made maybe 50 calls or maybe 100 calls at this guy. And I got, and this guy gives me now a guy who is around the ladies, the young ladies' location to get her out. So on one hand, well, what's what, what's up with her? And she's telling me it, it, it was five or six hours with her on WhatsApp, right? It's not, it's not a minute. This starts 8 a.m. It finishes 1, 2 p.m. And she says, listen, they're outside. And they're terrorists outside. They're trying to kill us. They're shooting people and so forth. And he got me together with these forces on the ground and we managed to get her out. And then we did it again. And again, and then in Bailey, and then Bailey was a big uh, city down south. I think the biggest one, right? It's about fourteen hundred uh, residents, really close to the fence. Um, and and Bailey was really a massacre over there. So suddenly these people start flowing to me, and my brother-in-law calls me and says, "Listen, you know what? I'll help. I don't care." And he starts sending these messages in brothers and sisters and arms WhatsApp groups, which is again hundreds of thousands of people around around the country. And I do the same in the entrepreneurs, uh, WhatsApp group, in the whatever, tech leaders for democracy, WhatsApp group. And people start spreading the word. word. So people started coming back to him and coming back to me um, and coming back to some friends, uh, coming back to my wife. And then suddenly I'm overflown with hundreds of people right now under fire. And they're telling me, listen, here's my location. Nobody's helping me. Can you please get the army here? All on WhatsApp, all being coordinated with both the people it's, who were under attack and the army on WhatsApp. All on WhatsApp. And I think in Saturday, I focus on Bailey because this is, I think, one of the, the hardest areas. And I just, just one, one person, the wife, kids are at home, right? So so um, uh, I focus on Bailey and I, and I get to the reason the first forces that break into Bailey. And and I end up with a guy with the commander that's called the Galleluia. Is right now coming from the fence around. So the terrorists were in the epic gate, the barbarians were in the gate, uh, actually, maybe, uh, shooting everybody coming in. So he goes around the fence, and this guy just 
you know, they just gave me his number and I said, listen, I, I got your number. Can you go down to South to Bailey? And he says, I'm on my way. Give me 15 minutes. And nobody else is telling him what to do. Right? He's like a colonel in the army. He has 25 or 30 people with him. We should, we should also say at this point that some week plus later, you discovered that Luria, this guy, actually got in his car from the northern border of Israel, from Betzet, and went south to save. He loaded, put on his uniform, put his gun on, and went all the way south to do that. And then two and a half or three hours later, which first of all tells you how small a country Israel is, is now at the fence in the southwest of Israel in Beirut, talking to you on the phone, uh, and you're kind of directing him to, to get people. But you only discovered this, that he came from the north like a week plus later. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know. He just sends me a WhatsApp message. I'm on my way 15 minutes. And then and when he comes in, I started working with him. Now, it's important to be, to be said that these, these cities downtown don't have streets names. Yeah. So we're supposed to New York City with, say, you know, I'm on the 6th and 25th or whatever. Yeah. Um, you can really, like, if you don't live there, there's no name. Right. This is all towns and villages with little roads. Yeah, it's like little roads and, and the houses, people know the houses according to the family name. Yeah. And, and the number. But if you go go to Google Maps, it doesn't appear there. So so I think it's a big issue because I end up working with three or four different ground forces of Bailey, every one of them in a different area of Bailey for like fourteen or fifteen hours, and they don't know the place. And they have no maps and really they don't know really that each other are working there. And and I'm 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 getting these locations from people, and I think at that time I think it's what's crazy is there are terrorists in the houses. It's not that this is done and the army is like you know the three to five terrorists in every house. Oftentimes, and I've spoken to many many families help and I help them. They're in their shelter locked. The the dad is pushing the the door handle so people don't open it. The terrorists are setting the house on fire because they can't open it because the dad is like this for 14 hours. And the door is becoming hot. And the terrorists are either putting it on fire or not putting it on fire and waiting outside the door, ambushing the, the forces coming in. So at that time, what I end up telling the forces is not just there are people in this house because they don't know where they are, but where they are because many have been kidnapped, but also where the terrorists are. To the extent that right now, listen, in, they send me WhatsApp pictures from the ground and it's a live location, and I send them back maps with drawings that I do on my iPhone or where the terrorists are, and and I try to and help them understand where, in which windows are the terrorists and where did they miss them. Um, and a few families were, we had one family, the mall family, where the dad has ALS, and he just, he, he's, he's, he's in a wheelchair. So we had to tell the two kids to jump through the bathroom window while the forces go in and blow up the door. And we knew there are two terrorists hiding from them, one in the stairs and one in the second floor. And it's very surreal because I'm just like, a, I'm just a CEO of a tech company, right? I, I don't usually, I don't usually work with ground forces to tell them where the terrorists are. Um, so that was Saturday. And I think Saturday finished, I think 2.30 AM. There are dozens of families like that. I, I thought it was over Saturday evening, but apparently it wasn't. Yeah. So, um, just to kind of cover off on something that's that's incredible. So you and I were at a uh, a bris, a circumcision, a brit milah, uh, for the for the son of someone who used to work for us at at, at Aleph. Um, yeah, I actually officiated at their wedding, uh, as you know, and their family is also from Bayri. Yep, and um, uh, we we're both. So this this child was born. Um, in the same hospital that the grandmother who was wounded in the in the evacuation of the people from Beirut was uh, where she was being treated. The baby was born a few floors underneath her. And then the, the grandmother passed away just hours before the circumcision uh, and the Brit Milah. And we we're both there at this uh, at this at this bris at this circumcision. Uh, and uh, I got to see actually this her family or her, her husband's family from Beirut come over to you. They, they thought that you were in the south in Beirut when you were directing them out of the room. By the way, this is this is you know one degree of separation Israel where you know Avi Gail, who is the mother of uh, of the child. Uh, you and I were on the phone, and these people who you helped save 
now turn up at the Briss um, on yeah. the day that the grandmother unfortunately perishes from this awful massacre. Um, and they didn't realize that you were in the center of the country doing this by WhatsApp. They thought you were directing rap wars in Beirut. What, what did you feel when, when you kind of met these people? Yeah, first of all, they're the first people I actually meet. Not, not. I, I got many phone calls afterwards and pictures and stuff like that, but they're the first people I actually meet. That, so, so Abigail's husband actually reached out to me some, sometimes on Saturday. He says, oh, I, I reached out to him. I think I got his phone number for somebody. He says, I know your family is down there. How can I help? And he had actually all of his family down there. I think yeah. about 10 people. And, and I worked with three different forces to get him out. And actually, our husband was very resourceful because it's because of them. And he was really sending me maps so we he worked with me for like seven eight hours so kudos to him and that's that's really i think i would think people thought of it as the meaning of family but that's some of the meaning of valley you don't give up on your family right um so what he felt is they, they hugged the the wife hugged me and she said listen it's because of you know we're alive you saved us they, they would not have found us and they think you know I, I i'm not sure i thought of being in that situation but i think it makes you um just grateful for the opportunity you had to help because uh, we talk about you know investing with an impact and improving the world and technology but we, we maybe forgot the Maslow pyramid right the first thing you know stay alive then yeah. you can eat then you can have wi-fi and all that good stuff right and and uh we can't do it out but, but i think that's really out, out of this world she had we you know we spent a lot of time together and and I think it was really amazing to see people that you managed to get out of there. And by the way, many of them wrote me like, thank you, Soldier Ami, uh, for getting me out. Why did they call me Soldier Ami? I don't, because because they told me, you, you, you spoke to us like the commander of Delta Force. You told us what to do. Um, and by the way, I think uh, equally, the mental support is equally important. I had a family in Kvaza with four kids and the wife uh, was really, it was really tough because she's four kids. 30 hours, 30 hours in a closed, like, small room. They're out of the air. There's, they, they, they don't have water. They don't have food. 30 hours, four young kids. She's telling me, Ami, I need to go out. The kids are thirsty, you know? They need food. And I tell her, don't go out, okay? I'm with you. She tells me we're all going to die. I told them, listen, you can tell me that. Don't tell the kids that, okay? You have me. We'll, we'll be together, and we'll figure it out together. Um, and, and it's always, uh, the darkest before, um, sunrise. Um, so I think equally is just getting you know, the army there and so forth, but equally is just being with these people that they don't break. I think it's super important. Yeah. And, um, what I want to do, uh, here today, uh, is also then take a, take a step back. Uh, you were in the Israeli Navy, I don't know how many years ago it is now, 18, 20 years ago, um, and your ship was hit by Hezbollah, another Iranian rock. You want to tell us about that? Uh, yeah, July 14, 2006, 8.42 p.m. Um, as you can notice, there are a few dates I remember very well, uh, dates and times. Uh, my, uh, I'm a naval officer, a middle lieutenant, um, uh, just off uh, Lebanon on a corvette called Anis Hanit, which means spear in Hebrew, uh, within a naval blockade, and the ship gets hit by a Hezbollah missile, C-802. Um, uh, actually, it's a, very, it's a very special story because it's the only time, it was Friday evening, it was the only time we did a couple of but at sea, like a big one. So um, clearly they, they planned to fire the missile Friday evening, but we, had, we were very lucky because because of the Kabbalah Shabbat, Dino was postponed, obviously. So so that means that when the missile hit, there were only three or four people at the back of the vessel. Most of us were in the, um, uh, it's called officer's mess, um, doing a blessing on the hot, uh, on the hot away. For blessing on the special bless, blessing on the bread for Shabbat. Yeah. And, and, and that saved a lot of people. And then the missile hit. Uh, we're obviously surprised. Uh, it's a very big missile, 8.5 meters. 120 kilograms of explosives. Um, four people died, 12 were wounded. It, it took eight and a half hours to take out the fire. We were towed away from Lebanon. Um, I was a tactical officer on board, so I was in the command information center all along, you know, talking to everybody, doing whatever I need to do. Uh, but to some extent, actually, Saturday, October 7th, I responded that way because I responded instinctively because of that event. 
because it wasn't the f- I, I felt under fire in Saturday for a second again. So I, I, I responded exactly like I was trained, which is go manage, go figure it out, get everybody together. Cause that wasn't what I used to do in the Navy. I don't know anything really changed me that experience, obviously. Yeah. I want to, by the way, uh, there's a famous uh, biblical expression, uh, where, uh, the vintner of Pharaoh says, I, 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 my sin, I recall today. So, uh, Ami, who's been to my house with his wife and kids and other people for for Shabbat, um, what when so so the siren went off in Jerusalem two hours after it went off in Tel Aviv. The first missiles were fired by Hamas to Jerusalem two hours later. So only at like eight twenty eight thirty in the morning did we know something was up. And I have a son who's in the army, and his phone started ringing. Get ready to come. And my second, another son who's in reserve duty, turned on his phone, and because we don't keep our phones on on Shabbat, and. Uh, and they said, you come to the army. And after another 10 minutes, I said, I better turn my phone. Something's going on. I turn it on. It's a message from Ami that says, uh, call me as soon as you can. <laughs> and um, uh, I hesitated. Uh, I'm saying, it's Shabbat. I never talk on the phone. I never turn on my phone. Why is Ami looking for me? He's one of my CEOs. Like, what's going on? And then I said, no, he knows that I wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do it. So I pick up the phone and call you. I said, What's up? You said, what took you so long? I, don't, I wouldn't call you if it was Shabbat. I know you keep Shabbat. There's an emergency. We got to go find people down south who can rescue people. And we start connecting. And, and, and I'll never forgive myself for that hesitation. And so uh, I want to thank you for having the right instincts. And I've learned from it. Um, that 10 or 15 minute hesitation until I actually called you by staring at my phone. Like, what the hell is going on? I, I won't forgive myself for. And uh, so thank you for Pretty being here. We're been 10 hours, you know, 10, 15 minutes, not that bad. Yeah, it could have been 10 hours. And then we started getting a hold. And I think what's interesting about that part of the story is you called the brothers and sisters in arms. And I called my buddy, uh, Erez Eshel and, and Yoel Zilberman, who both went down there immediately as soon as they heard on Shabbat morning, one from the Golan Heights and the other one uh, from Kfar Adumim and a bunch of other people. We started connecting people. Uh, Erez grabbed an ambulance and took a pregnant woman that you found, um, which was incredible. And just... The human stories of, and that, that baby was born, by the way, a couple of days later. Uh, the human stories are, are just incredible. And I think, you know, your instincts um, prove to be, you know, beyond critical uh, at this point in time. But I want to transition um, and let you tell me about your day job, because I think it's important for the next phase of the story. What What is your day job as as CEO of Windward, why'd you find, why'd you start the company? Um, uh, and what do you do? And then, and then I want to, I'll come back to kind of how all that comes together on, on the events of October 7th. Sure. So, so Windward is a shipping AI company. Um, what we do is, uh, we observe and track the world's ships and cargoes and ports and companies and help figure out risk in world trade. We work with about 200 customers, um, from ExxonMobil and VP at Shell to uh, Glencore, uh, some big, very big traders in all companies. Uh, we have um, uh, about two thirds of our revenue is governments and regulators. So the US government is our biggest customer worldwide, uh, more than 15 agencies um, uh, across DHS and DOD and everything you think of in, in the state of Europe, obviously in Israel and other places. And we also work with supply chain companies, the biggest freight forwarders in the world, to have a track and predict. Um, supply chain disruptions. So it's a software company traded in the London Stock Exchange, um, about 170 employees, uh, great, very nicely. And um, I think my day job, what I do is I work with our customers to understand, look two years, three years, four years in the future with them. They work back from there to what do they need to in order to get there more profitable or safe or secure. And I've co-build these technologies with them on a, on a day-by-day basis. And actually, the, it, and during this war, the last few weeks, we've rolled up, rolled out um, uh, a couple of new products that I think will make a big difference because of the situation. Um, uh, yeah, a, a couple, of, a, a couple of new products for maritime. Just to yep. be very clear about this, that's yes. because of the war situation and and the kind of pressure cooker that this puts you under, and 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 the way it's effective global affecting global supply chains and shipping companies. New product ideas around. Uh, AI and other things that that you've that you've been working on have now kind of 
okay, there's a real customer need here and we can roll this out. You've already rolled out and sold some of that in a short period of time. Yeah. L- listen, I think basically when you roll out a new product, everybody knows the hardest thing is what's called failure to product market fit. So this is basically startup under fire, right? It would, in such a pressure cooker right now, it is much easier to get a ton of feedback and fast because there's the, 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 there's, there's lives on the line. It's not just dollars on the line. Um, and when there's lives on the line, everybody operates in a different level of urgency. So I think you can, you can sit back and say, I'm shocked what's happening in the world. You know, oh my God, it's very tough. But as a leader of the company, I think hey, you need to make sure your people hold up. I think it's, it's not easy uh, because it's very emotional. It's very deep to, to many people. At the same time, we lean into our business and we make this a business opportunity. I think uh, never never miss out on a good crisis. Yeah, um, but this is kind of the famous Ben Horowitz wartime CEO. I think it's fair to say you're a wartime CEO right now. What what's some of the hardest things that you've had to deal with at the company level as a wartime CEO now? I think there's a lot of uncertainty because the drafting of the employees from the company uh, the reserve duty. The reserve drafting isn't in one day, and the spouses. So there's a, it's the people you have your manpower for the next six months is a move are is a moving target. You you know it's not that you know listen I pay I spend X I have Y people here's the production I can get what do I do with it? It's constantly moving about. So I think it's formalizing a more fluid way of management out uh, with your management team. Um, it understands what's important, focusing on the most on the top priority right now, and doing that first. And I think um, uh, many years ago, I met Mark Benioff, chairman CEO of Salesforce, and I think exercise with me says, "What's your top priority? What the top ten priorities? What top five? What's top three? What's top two? What's the top priority?" It's actually hard to do that. So, you know, getting inspired by that exercise with Mark, it's exactly what we're doing. We're doing this kind of in a every two or three days. Because on the one hand, your manpower changes. On the other hand, your customer needs are changing because there are new needs around the, the work. And at the same time, there might be technological breakthroughs you can do to bridge the two apart. So so I think it's not easy having that in your head, but actually having people focus on execution because the world, the non-Israel world, doesn't really care in the, in the business sense of the way. We need to keep delivering the results on a quarter-by-quarter basis. There are no excuses here. One of the things I keep hearing from our CEOs, which I just find inspiring, is this is Israel, we deliver. And um, everybody is absolutely committed, uh, war reservists or whatnot, to deliver for customers. And I think that's a key part of the country's resilience, the entrepreneurial resilience that's here. And it's it's become a rallying cry. We're Israel, we're Israelis, we deliver. And we're going to keep delivering. And to the point you made, there's there is more innovation coming out of this uh, then I think people understand. Um, at your company, you mentioned it, but let's go back also to uh, the days after October 7th. So you and I are talking, um, and I think you said, uh, we can't keep doing this on WhatsApp. This needs to be productized. Uh, this needs to uh, become something. And we talked about it. I said, okay, let's gather up a bunch of great Israeli engineers and product people and uh, and, and get at it. And so wh- why don't you tell the story of, of what happened right afterwards? Sure. For, first of all, I, I thought it suddenly ended Sunday morning. I wake up, I see it's not ending. And, you know, there's two more people. My wife tells me, what do you want to do? Or I said, I help them. So I call up a bunch of my, my PPs, uh, my PP product on me, let my CFO off it, and my PP person start to me tell them, can you just show up? And they just show up like 15 minutes afterwards. And then I arrived at an entrepreneur group. I said, kids, people come help. And suddenly by 10 a.m., there are 50 or 20 people at our house. And I end up like people reach out to me and then I give them, you talk to these part of the army, you talk to that. And then we understand, my wife tells me, I mean, this is too much. That you, you, we can't keep on doing this on WhatsApp. Let's build a product. Um, I said, well, you know, good idea. Sorry, I was like, hence, you know, uh, I was hence down. Um, I called Ed and your partner uh, in Aleph and they said, then can you come and help? 50 minutes afterwards, he's in the doorstep. Um, and, and we start working with that and, 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 and figure out how can we make this a product? Well, I think you mentioned low degrees of separation. I actually think the layer of founders, CEOs, COOs in Israel of growth companies is extremely tight. Um, I can mention the Neil Zohar and the from Wix, who is amazing. Uh, obviously you, you, you invested in the early days of Wix. I think you introduced me to Neil. 
and Mikhail Kaufman um, who for CEO of Fiverr is amazing, and Anne Kess from Papaya, and Guy Bloch from Brain, like you mentioned, it. and Geeky Levin is a big investor in this country. But the investors and talk about the CEOs are very tight. So I reach out to them and I said, listen, guys, we need help. Can you help? And suddenly, I think we have a team of, by Monday morning, 15 or 20 people productizing an idea that says, if Israel is attacked and the, the fight is on our ground, <clears throat> sorry, our ground, not an, on the enemy's ground, and people message you on WhatsApp, how do you collapse the time at scale to help them? And do that in hundreds or thousands of cases. So we think of a concept called Kval Ba'im, which in Hebrew is, we'll be right there. It's, by the way, intentionally in Hebrew, so everybody feels comfortable in this in this country. The, the Hebrews are, you know, obviously a word of common. Uh, and we start working on it. And so by Monday evening, there are about 20 people working on this product. Uh, by Tuesday morning, it's on the website of the biggest news website called Binet COL in Israel for people to reach out and get help. Uh, and I think right now it is it is a fully fledged product um, uh, that people can can reach out and get help, whether it's for evacuation or whether it's for more things under fire. And it's fully integrated with Monday.com and and the other products, uh, API products, but it's a fully integrated product for rescue people under fire. And not just that, also to provide intelligence and location-based intelligence information to the forces, and it's been it's been integrated also into institutional civic society without saying more than that uh, at, at 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 all levels. And so this this product that came about in forty eight hours, which Ed and my partner now thinks is actually maybe a company um, that that can be built around it uh, for civic response globally. Uh, Thank you. And, what's that? Uh, yeah, I agree with them. I called him up a few days to say that. Tell them that. Yeah, yeah I, I, this is this is a global need, and it's again the hardest thing is to get the product market fit. Yeah, and, and I think it's also fair to say that a bunch of the companies that worked on this, whether it was a Bring or Monday, uh, et cetera, uh, found new products and new product market fits and new markets coming out of all this innovation, and so, like. Let's let's roll this movie forward a year or two or three now. W where are some of the areas of innovation that you think will have come out of this awful, atrocious massacre and the crucible that it created uh, for for Israeli tech? First of all, I have to say I think it's global tech, not just Israeli tech. I think the, the I think the need basically you see a rallying of the West that would say around Israel. You can see the private sector. The UK and Germany and France and as President Biden here. Um, so, so I think it's important to say I don't think by now it's an Israeli thing. I think it's a global thing. Okay, it's important. There were Israeli tech developed based on this, but to global customer base. Correct. Uh, very, I think it's a very important thing because you need to work, right? Uh, I think there are the obvious suspects. Uh, uh, video analytics, um, to me, is an obvious suspect. Uh, suddenly, I think it's the first case ever in history that I know of. That you have just open source like that amount of open source videos and just identify who's been kidnapped, you know, who's been murdered. It's just so hard. And these yeah. uh, videos are on, from phones and you know whatnot. So I think that's one. I think civic response is another one. Um, uh, we've been working with one of the other other companies and their, their logistics platform, something. So there are a lot of civic response use cases for them. Uh, which actually, by the way, they also tweaked the product uh, in the last three weeks. The, the half of their company is working on building that product and tweaking it. Um, so I think they're clearly a civic response. Um, I think there are different elements of intelligence, uh, I heard, uh, that are building. I'm sure there's cyber intelligence. And I think there's, there's location-based intelligence because I think as a country, we're completely so caught by surprise. Um, and I think the country was actually a bit of a, in a bit of a shock for the first two or three days. But since yeah. that a lot makes you think people have been rallying up and really every bit of technology and talent is trying to be directed to that. I think, by the way, some investors in the U.S., guys like Matt Ocko and Josh Wolf, who have been investing in at, at, and, and Trey Stevens at Founders Fund, um, who have been investing in defense tech over the last years, have probably, uh, some of their companies have gotten tested in the crucible here uh, as well. And that probably moves uh, a bunch of those companies 
uh, forward as well. Israel became on some level a, a beta site or a or a real yep. use case for for some of those technologies. Um, uh, 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 wanna, well, if I may, you know, these guys are all they're all great guys. Most of the investment in defense tech and stuff like that went to U.S. companies. Yes, because yes. Because you know, the assumption is that the, 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 their market is the biggest, so they get to the product market fit the fastest. Um, so actually, I think this is an interesting turning point, uh, actually to bring that attention to Israeli companies who are innovating under fire for the Western world. And I would not underestimate that because one of the things we, we haven't seen with Israel is the big defense tech investment in companies like You've seen Cell Drone, obviously Palantir is supposed to boy and the rail. Um, they're much more. There's a fascinating question in my mind here, which is if you are an Israeli founder post October 7th, post the day of the Simchat Torah massacre, are you going to go build something different than maybe you would have built had you started your company a year ago? Good question. I think the answer is yes. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think the answer is yes, and we think um, maybe you would also build it differently. I, I think if you, by the way, if you take a step back, I think we in Israel, we have a responsibility to make the world not give up on us uh, from a business perspective. Because equally, people can say, you know, a lot of investment opportunities. This place has a lot of uncertainty. There's war, there's political unrest, you know. Don't have to deal with these guys. Let's wait for a year or two for it to sell down. So I think it's really on us to go back to we deliver and to show the resilience and our capability to build companies at global scale and make sure and on the business level, this just make us stronger and better. Yeah, I think you hit the key word, which is resilience. Uh, civic society has shown incredible resilience here. The military has shown resilience here after the initial failure. Um and I think there is a esprit de corps which has turned up in a broad swath of Israeli society that wants to be resilient technologically, business-wise, and 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 embrace life. And I, I think the other thing, you know, I think this is this is part of what you're saying is um, the technologies we build, in addition to being incredible businesses, should embrace life um, yeah. and should embrace making humanity a better place. It's not just not give up on us. This is where you're going to want to be if you want to find resilient founders and find people who want to build technologies that build big businesses and embrace life. Yeah. And and if you, by the way, if you if you take Israel oddly, quite for a second look at the last three years, you, we had two years of COVID. <laughs> then we had, it's my, it's my, this, the CEO of Rejok, two years of COVID. And then you had the war in Ukraine. You have interest rates go up uh, and capital dry up. So there's a lot of things that require actually resilience and resourcefulness and the ability to gather a team and, you know, navigate as we go. And actually, if you look at an art business, and, and she's been working very nicely, and uh, we had a lot with fairy term thesis, and I'd like to quote Peter Thiel, Thiel here that says, to build a big company, you need to be right for a long time on something everybody else thinks you're wrong. Yeah. And, and, and I think... As a founder CEO to a run of business like in these times, it's hard to need to be resourceful. I know a lot of companies in the freight tech industry, supply chain industry, I can mention well, Convoy was valued at $3.8 billion a year and a half ago. They went back um, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's a company called Slit, which raised $80 million, I think, uh, from Goldman Sachs, $240, uh, um, filed for Chapter 7 and so on. I can, I can give you a lot of other examples. And, and my view is, I'm sure they're all amazing businesses that had a great technology and a great market, but then things changed. Uh, there was a recession, the demand went down, the, the, the interest rates went up, and probably, I think in hindsight, somebody didn't respond well enough to keep them afloat and successful. So I think if you choose founders, that's what you should think about. You know, at, it, in the 1900s, a century ago, when historians talked about the 1920s, they called them the Roaring Twenties. I have been floating in my head and to other people the idea that when we look back on the 20s of the 21st century, it's going to be called the Chaotic Twenties. Yep. Uh, chaos reigns, and in chaos, you need resilient people. Um, and we're not out of the chaos yet, obviously. You know, the war between Russia and Ukraine is still ongoing. Who knows what happens in China and Taiwan? Um, the maps are being redrawn. I think most people 
thought that in the 21st century maps wouldn't be redrawn. Uh, I've never thought that for what it's worth, and you've written about that in my books. But it's, uh, but but the world is changing in front of our eyes, and uh, many of the isms of the last 20 or 30 years have peaked and, and, are, and are now behind us. And uh, and so I guess just in finishing, the one thing I want to ask you is, no one comes, you know, just like you said, you you, you came out somewhat different from the event of your your a missile hitting your ship. You, you, there's no way to come out of this. Uh, event, uh, if you're a bystander, and certainly not after what you went through, uh, there's no way to come out of it the same person. Right. Um, so if you reflected for a second, and obviously your answer may be different in a year, so we won't hold you to it uh, or two. What, what has changed about you uh, since three weeks ago or four weeks ago? Um, well, it's a good question. First of all, I think um, I'm not sure I'll be calm anymore because I think it... it Kind of, kind of undermines your basic security about the world. As a dad, as a you know head of a family, you need to be. You know, I don't think I ever expected to be on at this level. Uh, and by the way, you could see a lot of anti-Semitism around the world right now. If you were on the plane landing in Dagestan, wherever that was in Russia, and from Israel, I'm not sure it's a bit, you know, it's a good outcome for you right now. It didn't, it didn't steal well for sure. For campuses oh. in America. Or campus, I think Cornell University, I saw them telling their Jewish uh, students, please don't go to your <laughs> to the place where you can get kosher food. Yeah. Um, uh, which I think is is, is crazy to, to say and do. And I've seen, um, I've seen Stanford University and Cambridge University, Oxford University's professors um, uh, write very naughty things, I think. So, so I think, first of all, I thought that part of the world was done, I have to say. Uh, I'm not sure it's done. So I think that's one thing. Um, I think the second thing is, um, you know, I might go over an article about that. I thought about the public sector as being separate. Although I have public sector customers, I thought of them as custom. And and I think we have to think about a new lotto for civic involvement. Um, I'm not sure we can stay outside and say anymore, well, we're running a business, good luck with that, you know. We'll just be our tap seat on. I'm not sure that works anymore because the the other side, in this case Hamas, but it could equally be Hezbollah, they work asymmetric in in, in, in the a, a, asymmetric, asymmetrical warfare. So, and the problem with these big civic systems is they're very slow. Because they're very big. They need they need bureaucracy. So perhaps the the answer that we need to get to as a society is. How do we combine the best of both worlds? The wide and depth of execution of big system with the agility of people like us who can drop everything and, and think of stuff. Maybe last yeah. but not least, in, in, in this, actually in this event in the last few three weeks, I ended up, you know, the people who were with us and it shows you the parts of the bond were obviously, you know, like my wife and kids, this for me. My brother-in-law, ex-employees of our company, a lady called Unit Hoffman, just saw me do that, and she used to be an employee. They decided to just kicked up eight ex-employees of Wentworth, threw them on the problem, create a form, and created hundreds of people to come to her. So I think it shows you the bond between people doesn't stop, start and stop at you work for me, I work for you, but it's this organic bond we build together to figure things out. I think it's a it's a more human view of of the lack of communities that we now have because these people are lonely. So I think we shouldn't be lonely because we build these virtual communities with us that, that at a time of need, they, they come together. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I actually think that it's the physical bond that you know somebody, you really know them, not just online, that has enabled a lot of the coming together just and resilience to solve this problem and the, and the mutual support. Um, and I agree, by the way, with 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 everything uh, that you said. Ami is referencing an article he and I wrote for one of the Hebrew uh, language papers here, entitled uh, "Pioneering 2.0," um, that w- which basically says that the operating system of civic society is, you know, AI, iPhone, Android, whereas the operating system of a public service is, at best, Windows 95 and maybe the Pony Express today. Um, and that needs to be solved, uh, and we need to upgrade it. And that requires more civic 
uh, responsibility. I'll tell you an interesting story I heard last night. I was in the finance ministry at a very late last night, and uh, the first responders uh, to the South who took care of the gruesome, gruesome sites of the people who had been massacred there uh, is an organization called Zaka, which is a civic organization. Um, and these, you know, almost 100 people who, who picked up beheaded babies and, and other things you need some mental health treatment, uh, obviously. And uh, the finance ministry and minister wanted to deliver them 5 million shekels for treatments like this. Three weeks later, after he issued the order, it still wasn't done because it was winding its way through the bureaucracy. And that's just not okay, not during wartime or anything. You know, kudos to the heads of the finance ministry that were trying to do that. And shame on us as civilians that we haven't updated their operating system. I, I want to close with actually uh, something uh, deeply personal. Um, so, uh, number one, some of the unsung heroes of what's going on here are grandparents right now who have filled in with kids, uh, as, as many husbands and some wives have gone off, uh, to reserve duty. Um, throughout this discussion, uh, you've mentioned your wife, Adi, who is a leader in her own right. Um, and, uh, you know, said right at the beginning, had the instinct, said this is the Yom Kippur war and kind of kept pushing you going and, and you were in the. You were in this kind of thing together. She's calling, you're calling, and, and everybody's uh, calling or, you know, doing the work and helping you pull pull the whole thing together. Uh, tell me how you think about, uh, you know, there was always a joke behind every successful guy. There's a surprise mother-in-law and a very smart wife. Um, but I, I feel like through this last three weeks, um, I speak for my, myself, uh, the partnership with, with my wife and uh, has become ever stronger. Um, talk to me about the importance of, of Adi, both in the company and, and in the last few weeks. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, um, if you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to answer it. I'm very comfortable. I think it's a better of my life. Um, I, I think in my, in my view, we're building everything together. I think building a family is a long-term partnership, building a business is a long-term partnership. Also, everything that you build here at the house was was part of that partnership when people walked in. I was on the phone with the army and says, hey, what's up? I said, Court, she runs everything here. So she had, she basically rock ran everything. I was just on the phone with the army Friday or Sunday morning. Um, and I think you have to have um, a level of trust between you and other spoken understanding of what's important and what's important and the ability to believe in each other and follow each other and support each other but also, I would even say in this in this case, walk in that journey together, because usually people talk about spouse in the in the of supporting. I think that actually does not do justice, because supporting means somebody's in the back seat. I don't think of it as a back seat, but front seat. I think of it as two front seats. Um, uh, and I think that's that's the way I think about our business, and that's you might view that's her role. For, for me and the company, she's she's for me partnering, figuring out what to do and how to manage stuff and stuff like that. And I know from her, hopefully that's mutual. But also same in this event and many other events, same race with family. It comes back to the world. The world is hectic. My view is we're not at it alone. We're at it together. And I think the law, from, to paraphrase, is the answer. Um, if the if bad people are saying, you know, life starts at death, at death I think life starts at birth and it's about love. It's about building the family. It's about building the business, it's about building community. It's about saving lives. It's about doing good things. I think if you live a positive life with a positive life partner, you end up happier, more successful, um, uh, more secure. Um, but, but actually that's, that's what life is about. And it's better just to go through that journey with a partner that grows together with you. But I think, I, I gotta say can equally challenge in everything. Um, and, and that's, I think, part of, I, I have a good friend who told me that many years ago, uh, that I married, uh, a female version of me. I, I disagree with that. I think she's much better than me, but I we think married to that level, I think is the best decision I made in my life. Thank you for that. I feel the same way about my partnership with my wife. Um, unfortunately, or we haven't had much time actually to sit and talk over the last three weeks. I, I assume we've got to do the same thing. There's, there's a lot of, like you said, unspoken words and uh, division of labor and, you know, each one driving 
cars <laughs> from the front seat right now. But yeah, thank yeah. you for that. Um, Ami, uh, thank you for your service to our people and to the world. Thank you uh, for keeping the company delivering and running. Uh, our investors, thank you. Uh, your investors, thank you. Uh, I think the world thanks you for that. And uh, looking forward to doing this again. And I'll probably see you later today because it feels like we've seen each other a whole lot over the last three weeks. <laughs> <laughs>